Thoth Hermes podcast. Welcome to the world of the Western esoteric tradition. friends and listeners and welcome to episode 9 of season 10 of the Thoth Hermes podcast. Today is Sunday, October 22nd and this is your favorite podcast with your host Rudolf and I'm welcoming you to talk today about grimoires, about conjuration, about what magic really is and we meet with David Rankin to talk about all of this. David, who has been, I don't have to introduce him, I think, to many of you. David, who has been around with many interesting books, with many interesting features. And it's been a lovely talk I had with him. You will hear more of that later. For those of you who expected Marlene Seven Bremner here today, yes, I announced her last week. We had, for personal reasons, to postpone that interview by Two weeks or so. She will be here in two or three weeks on this show uh, and I did not mess that up last, last week but well things change sometime but I just wanted to mention that so that you are not surprised. I welcome everybody here who is with us for the first time. It's great to have you here for the first time. I hope it will be many times that you will return like many many others who I welcome just as heartily. Thank you for being with us every week, every week for a new show and all the shows that have been produced so far, 156 it is with the one we produce here today that you can find online in all the major outlets, podcast outlets on YouTube, of course, but also in on the website, on the website thoughthermes.com, that is T-H-O-T-H-E-R-M-E-S.com. Would be lovely if you went there not only to listen to the shows, but also to see all the web pages, the show notes that we have for all the shows. And it's really interesting. It's become a bit like an encyclopedia as well, like the one we are trying to talk about here today, um, an encyclopedia of knowledge of the Western mystery tradition. And you will also find the possibility there to send me a feedback, feedback uh, through email, of course, info at thoughtshermes.com, feedback on the web page via voicemail, voicemail, use it more often, not many of you have used it so far, but it's always very nice to hear your voices, and also there is a contact form, of course, but you can also use, as many of you do, Facebook or Twitter to come back, or X as it's called now, to come back to me and tell me what you think about the show, if you like it, what you don't like, what you would like to see other or progress or give me ideas if you have any to share with me and share your music with me. Uh, next week, again, we will have one of our listeners whose music will be produced here Um and uh, I'm already looking forward to that. So if you are a musician, if you are a producer of music, an artist, and want to produce your music here, do let me know and send it to me and we will show it to all of our listeners here. Thanks to all of you who are supporters of this show. Thanks to the patrons. Uh, supporters and you are the ones who make this show possible and there uh, goes a particular thank you to Imbolc Western School of Magic who is our patron on the initiate level and who supports this show with their contribution. Imbolc is a really interesting Western Magic School and you find the link on the show notes as well, imbolc.com. Um, you can find out all about that school. Right, so I talked about music and of course there is music also this week. But before that, why have you not 
yet become a patron? Hmm. Please, become a patron. Consider it $1 per episode. That must be worth it, right? And it helps to maintain this show possible, to make it possible every week. And uh, it would be lovely if you joined. If you prefer to buy me a coffee, you can also buy me a coffee now. I got the first couple of coffees last week. Yeah. Um, so there is also that buy me a coffee button on the website. So everything is appreciated. Each support that you can give this show is appreciated. Of course, I do not only buy coffee with the coffee money. I help produce this show with it. Right. Yes, I promised me music. Now it's time for it. And sometimes I just go on YouTube and, you know, music is also my, has been my business. I must say I'm no longer actively in that, uh, in that profession, but, um, I love music and I love musicians who are special and young musicians who are special in particular. And I discovered, well, I wasn't the first one to discover her. She has already about 900,000 followers on YouTube. But I just thought I have to, I have to bring the music of that young lady. Uh, she's working by the name of Gamasta, Gamasta, and she is, well, doing piano covers of famous pop and uh, rock songs. And, well, I chose three pieces here today, which I think are particularly interesting covers, all just piano. And if you have the occasion also to see her play, because it's also part of, of the impression she makes when you see her, how intense her play is um, but already listening to it is quite something so if you want to see her I put the link in the show notes as well to her YouTube channel let's start with uh, one of the three famous pieces I chose for today's show Hans Zimmer's Time from Inception a piano cover by the young pianist Gamatsta enjoy
I find that fascinating, the way she plays that music with piano only and uh, um, the sound she produces. And uh, so Gamatsta, the piano cover of Time from Hans Zimmer, rather special. And uh, we will hear more of her later, as usual, later in this show. But now we turn to David Rankin, David Rankin, who has achieved an enormous task. He has published the Grimoire Encyclopedia in two volumes, 1400 pages. Two volumes so far, I must say, because as we will learn in the interview, it might not be two in the end. It might be more coming. It's a Convocation of Spirits, Texts, Materials and Practices. That's the subtitle. So yes, it's an encyclopedia, but it's more than that. It's a book that you that you open and read and follow up and you have the whole the essential reading part with, of course, uh, books he suggests and a hundred grimoires he's talking to us about in this volume. And in the second volume, there is a whole number of appendices well it's it, you have to see it believe it it's 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 incredible it's an incredible task an incredible work he did there and uh, you can only be ad admiring this but beyond that we will speak a lot about um, his also his life and his experiences as a magician as a practitioner uh, it's been really a highly interesting talk and a highly pleasant talk and I hope you will feel that that pleasant moment that I passed when I did that interview with David Rankin and um, I will maybe just as usual read you a few lines from the introduction to the book to this grimoire and it says when I began this work I did not realize the scope of my undertaking nor did I appreciate the numerous realizations that would come from such a panoramic study. Themes run through the grimoires consistently with a wealth of variations which flavor the individual grimoires subtly like an immense collection of spices. What is clear is that there are three main themes running parallel through grimoires with greater or lesser importance in individual works. These themes are spirit conjuration, divination, and simple charms and spells for dealing with the hardships of daily life and seeking to improve it. So that's what grimoires are all about. That's what makes up a grimoire. David will specify that as well in the interview. So I think without further ado, we should go to meet David and uh, enjoy the talk. Uh, it's been really special and uh, I'm sure that you will, just as me, learn a lot from what he has to say. Meet David Rankin. Here comes the interview. Today I have the pleasure to welcome on the Thos Hermes podcast, David Rankin. David, who has recently published a... Uh, 1,400 page, two volume edition of a grimoire encyclopedia. Quite a brick uh, that you that you produced there and a wonderful book, two books, to be honest. And um, it's great to have you here, David, at this occasion. And good evening and greetings to the United Kingdom here from Austria. Uh, good evening, Rudolf, and thank you very much for having me. Finally, I must say, we have planned that for quite some time, haven't we? And then I took that break and you had a baby, if I may say that. Yes. And so <laughs> as life took over, uh, we finally get together here. Um, David, before we talk about the Grimoire Encyclopedia and, and all of that, um, I think there is also a lot of other uh, terrain to cover because of course this didn't come out of the blue just that you produced that huge that huge uh, task but um uh, as we know you of course you have uh, written several books you are a researcher in the history of of magic but you are i suppose but you're going to tell us all about it uh, also somebody who 
you who works with what he writes about so who is a practitioner i would think um and maybe we should start there in your I don't know if you are one of those who started at the age of five to conjure or if it came later. How did it all start for you? When, where did it all begin with magic and all of your interest in that stuff? Yeah, well, not quite at five like some, but uh, <laughs> uh, although when I was around five or six, I started um, finding books on mythology, like children's books on mythology. So, um, you know, books on Celtic and Norse and Greek and Egyptian myths and things, but I wouldn't claim that that got me into magic. They were just some of the books that I read then. Mm -hmm. um, uh, when I was 10, I discovered the, the Tao Te Ying, which is my favorite book still today of all the books right. I've ever read. That's always remained my favorite. Uh, and the works of Jung, which I ploughed my way through. Um, and I found interesting in places, tedious in places, probably awful lot I didn't grasp, considering that I was only 10 at the time. But at 14, um, a friend of school gave me a catalogue from Occultique, which is, uh, was an occult shop and supplier here in written back in the 70s and 80s and uh, more well a lot longer than that actually but i think now they just mail order but um i that was back in 1979 i had a look at the catalog i decided to order half a dozen books from it um quite an interesting <laughs> collection of books that i ordered <laughs> my first order was um Mavis's Key of Solomon, Sacred Magic of Admiral and the Mage, Grimoire of Armadale, Levi's Transcendental Magic, Crowley's Magic, and Francis King and Stephen Skinner's Techniques of High Magic. So I think something was nudging me that those should be my first books that I bought. Um, I read Techniques of High Magic first because that looked like the easiest, most practical read <laughs> to a 14-year-old. For yeah, this is this is it. This is what I'm going to do with my life. Started doing the exercises and practices in there. Started to like two hours a day every day doing all the things: like pentagram ritual, hexagram ritual, middle pillar, ritual of the rose cross, etc. Right. And what do, what you do as a good ceremonial magician when you start, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then started getting more, you know, looking in the sort of bibliographies of these books and ordering more books and kind of went on from there. Um, when I was like hitting 18, um, sort of an encounter with somebody who I knew playing sports, um, I, he asked me a question and I answered and he told me I'd given the right answer and I was then invited to go along and meet his lodge master of the magical lodge that he was in. Mm-hmm. And uh, I met the lodge master. He said, you're going to come back this time next week and I'm going to test you. And if you get anything wrong, I'm not interested. But if you get it all right, then we can talk. <laughs> Quite I've some pressure. 40 years <laughs> memorizing correspondences and all this stuff. And I didn't get anything wrong. I got in. It was a group that was derived from Stella Matutina, but they focused on grimoire mm. conjurations and that side of things. So that was like my first experiences. I mean, the guy who was the master of the temple had an eidetic memory. So that meant you know, he only had to look at it once and it was there. He could right. no hard work memorizing conjurations and stuff for him. You know, a very talented magician. And, you know, the first time I was there in a conjuration, it just completely blew me away. It, shifted my worldview like when you, you know the, when you have that experience of the external reality of spirits hmm. um everything changes right and so i was involved with that group for a while but because i went off to do like a you know, degree um you had to live locally to the lodge to 
be part of it. So I had to leave. So I left on good terms. Um, but that was a fantastic sort of grounding for me. Um, How long were you there with that lodge? It was only like around a year or so. Mm -hmm. But it was amazing, the, the people there. There was no social interaction at all, nothing outside of getting together and doing the work. They were very old school. You just got together. You didn't meet up. You didn't even, if you saw someone you knew, you didn't even acknowledge them on the street. It was. Right, right. Well, as you say, that's, together. that's really the good old school, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, may I interject a question here? Um, I'm interested to hear you on that because, sorry to interrupt you with that, but I think it's an important bit, uh, which today is often not respected. I mean, you can you can uh, accept that or you can say, I don't think that's a good idea. But what's your take on that? Is is that old traditional way to separate social life from lodge life completely? Is that in your view and in your experience, is that positive? Is that helping magic or is that, uh, well, equal? Um, I think there's been a, I mean, in the last... 40 years or so, I've seen a lot of change. And um, for a lot of stuff I've seen, it's like it, be it becomes like a social club for people. Uh, right. And it distracts from the actual doing the magic. Uh, yeah, there you are. Hmm. And also the discipline aspect of it, you know, not just the discipline of your daily practice, But that this is you know where your focus is when you're together. You just talk about and do the magic. You know when I've run magical groups over the years, um, when when people turned up, they're not allowed to talk about what they watched on TV or stuff like that because you're not there to to do that. Um, yes, it's nice to socialize with people, but as soon as that comes into magical groups. The dynamic can change. Um, Absolutely. So I think there is definitely a value in keeping the magical groups for that. And, you know, when you start socializing outside of the group and meeting up to go to the, the pub or for meals and things like that, it's the dynamic changes. And I don't want to say laziness, but that sort of lack of coherence can creep right. in. Right. I, I'm with you. I, I, I just wanted to hear you on that because uh, uh, I'm absolutely with you. Uh, I think that's a crucial point even. But sorry, I, inter I interrupted your, your, your account. Sorry about that. So, yeah, I mean, I think definitely if you want to, and also it's very private and secret. You know, you know there's no website for, You know, the, this lodge up on the internet. There's like people don't know who's in it. Um, there were some interesting aspects of it, which I found I've not really seen elsewhere, but I thought were really um, clever. For example, you know, when you do have a lodge system, you have grade requirements you know, with grade structures. In that lodge that I was in, you did not know what the requirements were. So it wasn't people trying to chase badges and degrees. It was like, at a certain point, you were told, you have fulfilled the requirements by doing these things. We, we will now initiate you up to the next degree because you have done all the things that were required of you. And because you didn't know, you just got on with doing the work. You were focused on doing the magic. You weren't focused on, oh, what do I need to get to practicus or adeptus exemptus or whatever it might be. You were just, mm -hmm. you were just there. You did and enjoyed the work, and that was it. So I think that was something I've not seen elsewhere, but I think is brilliant to people don't know what they have to do, so there isn't that pressure. They just focus on the magic, not Absolutely. trying to get that's, that. That's fascinating and. Uh, that's also why I'm insisting on that point, because I think you had a, a great experience there. And w without giving names, but uh, was that part of a larger structure, that, that lodge? Or was it the lodge that was says, I, I'm, we are a magical lodge and we're working whatever type of ceremonial magic? Or did they belong to a larger system? Uh, well, they had come from 
like I say, from Stella Matutina, yeah. but they didn't, they weren't really connected elsewhere to right. other people. No, they were just a group doing their thing. Right. Um, and there was no interest in being public or mm. trying to attract people. I only got in because when I was like a teenager, I used to wear like this little silver um, tree of life around my neck. Uh-huh. And this guy had spotted it, and then he asked me something. I answered, gave the right. And I know that's something I've heard from friends that, like, um, for example, with some traditional witch families, that there's a thing of asking somebody a question, and if they answer in the correct way, they get mm-hmm. considered in. So I know mm-hmm. it's not just the lodge. That, that does occur in other traditions. But um, you know, if I'd have got it wrong, I'd never have known. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I mean, it was a time, we're talking about the 80s there, right? We're talking about the early 80s, yeah. Yes, a time when, in, of course, in the UK, um, this was a very active scene uh, for that type of groups, right? Well, uh, whatever you think of it, but Gardner uh, made it, uh, uh, certainly certainly created a lot of, of movement. And then, of course, the, uh, the, the, the late, the, the late uh, findings of the Crowley area, etc. Uh, all of that had created an, uh, 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 an air that, uh, that breathes a lot of, of magic and magical groups. So am I right? Or is that the imagination we have from the outside? No, I think that's very true. There were, you know, that was, you know, we get the end of the 70s and beginning of the 80s, you're having like this sort of the birth of chaos magic. Right. Also, and true. Things like that, yes. you know, coming. Um, there was, you hadn't really hit the conferences and things yet, but there were things going on and it was more, people knew each other through the contact they made through places like, for example, Atlantis Bookshop and Watkins in yeah. London, you know, places yeah. like that. Um, and there was like the odd little thing that happened, but it wasn't that sort of social thing so much, you know. And right. there was a lot. And when you started getting events happening in the late 80s, what was interesting in those pre-internet days is it was a much more positive dynamic between the different types of group. Mm-hmm. So, you know, you might be, if you if there was something on in a pub, for example, you'd be sitting at a table with people from the OTO and the IOT and Alexander and Gardner and Wickens, Golden Dawn. People were all talking about magic. There wasn't a, my group's better than yours or stuff. People were interested to hear what other people were doing and what they could learn from people. Mm-hmm. Um, there wasn't that fracturing, which I think came later, particularly with the internet where, you know, it has yeah. its very double-edged sword thing, but certainly, there certainly. was a lot more focus uh, with the people and <laughs> a much higher percentage of people who were really serious about doing magic. Yeah, was there were people fewer people who did it, but those who were doing it, had the, as you said, were more serious about it, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it was very interesting times. I think the 80s was very um, fruitful like that. Mm-hmm. You know, there was a, a lot of things, sort of seeds were sort of planted late 70s, early 80s, which then... yeah. Yeah, yeah. Expanded but, but, but then when you moved away, uh, so you had to leave that group. And what what happened then with you personally after that? In that respect, um, I met uh, other people. Um, I got involved with a group in Oxford, um, Oxford Golden Dawn and Coal Society, or Ogdos, as it was known. Okay. There's a really good group of people there. You know. Um, was involved with this was like Mog Morgan, who does Mandrake. Right, Mog. yeah, who, who was um, on the show here, of course, as well, uh, some time ago, yeah. Um, and various others. And we sort of founded like a practical group there back in 86. Um, mm-hmm. They put on the first Philemic Symposium and the Magical Art Exhibition. And Oxford was like a really thriving, one of the sort of big magical centres Sort of mid to late 80s in, in Britain. You know, you had Oxford mm-hmm. and Leeds and London was like 
the three places where things were really sort of buzzing at the time. Um, right, I didn't know about Leeds, London, yes, of course, and Oxford I was aware of, but I wasn't aware of, of Leeds as well. Yeah. Oh, Leeds, you had, I mean, you had Ray showing up there with, with Aromatics, um, Dave Lee, a lot of the sort of big, chaos, Phil Hine, a lot of the sort of chaos, oh, of course, was there, people yeah. mm-hmm. were all up there mm-hmm. yeah. you know, doing yeah. stuff. Um, yeah. So, yeah, the Leeds scene was like really buzzing as well. They did one conference, which was a lot of fun, went to. Um, People like Lionel Snell uh, spoke at it. It was a really uh, uh-huh, good event. Uh-huh. But, um, so, yeah, I mean, Ogdos was a lot of fun. It was kind of like quite an experimental group because there were people from different backgrounds. And so we decided the way to go forward was if each of the people who was looking to be in the group led a ritual And we decided the planets was a good thing. So everyone took a planet and would use the techniques and things that they really liked in the ritual mm-hmm. they created for the group. And then when we'd done the whole cycle, we'd look at what had really worked and move forward from there. And, and that was what we did. I mean, it's, it was kind of like, um, so it's big under, a lot of polemic stuff with an element, a bit of an element of chaosy. Um, and bits of Kabbalah and other things. It was quite a mishmash of <laughs> yeah. what was going on. Quite eclectic, would I hear. Yeah, it was definitely mm-hmm. quite eclectic and some very interesting rituals. Uh, um, and from Oxford, I moved to London. Um, and that was interesting. You know, I um, worked in Scoob 2, which was the bookshop there at the time, which was publishing Kenneth Grant. Mm. Um, so I worked on like, editing some of Kenneth Grant's books and that was fun I also worked in Atlantis Bookshop a bit um, then I moved to Cardiff, I got involved in Alexandria and Wicca okay, I didn't know that mm. um, yeah um, my partner of the time initiated me into Alexandria and Wicca I'd stayed away from Wicca prior to that in the 80s because I had known quite a few people in Wicca um, but it didn't really appeal to me because the people I'd encountered and I'm not saying they were all like this but the people I had encountered did not have that serious magic attitude Mm -hmm. that was what I looked for in the people I was working with yeah whereas the high priestess who initiated me did And I thought, uh-huh. okay, here's somebody that could work with. Yeah. Um, and, you know, we ended up running Coven and that became very much more <laughs> um, ceremonial magic based, certainly in the training and stuff. Okay. Um, so Wick is sort of like um, the Book of Shadows is a skeleton. You know, you have to put the, the muscles and the flesh on yourself and, Sure. For me, the muscles and flesh that went onto it needed to be more ritual magic y grimoire stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you created your own style of Wicca, basically, if, if, or is that exaggerated to say, to put it that um, way? Yeah, I think. I mean, there, there was a whole thing of, back then of, um, well, people got into this idea of like progressive Wicca and being more eclectic, but it was just Wicca that put more emphasis on ritual magic stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, so it was, you know, it was Alexander, which Alexandrians always done. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's kind of went a bit further. Right. And I suppose I brought in, you know, the stuff I'd done elsewhere into um, the coven to focus people more on that side of things. So, but whilst at the same time keeping the outdoor element, which is something I've always liked because that's something that's, very much there with the grimoires, you know, like mm-hmm. doing conjurations. It's easier to do them indoors, but I think it's more fun to do them outdoors. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so I see what you mean. Yeah, 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 yeah. You, you just said something uh, that uh, I wanted to ask you to explain what your view on that is. You, you said you were looking for people with serious magical attitude. 
And I, I find that an interesting term. What what is for you? I think that might be different for for different people. But for you, what is the characteristics of a serious magical attitude for you? Um, someone who you can see has. You can tell when people have put in years of disciplined practice mm. um, in the way that, you know, if you talk to them just from the way they talk about magic, the experience, the the vibe they have about them, um, and that it's, there's like a passion, like a fire that people who are like really, you know, devoted to the magical path have, that it's not. A social thing. It's not a meeting up, right? You know, just for the full moons and stuff. It's like because you know, magic is a way of life. It's how you engage with the world. It's not just mm -hmm. about the rituals. Mm -hmm. It's the whole of how, like I say, you live your life and engage with the world. So, you know, when you meet people who have that, I found that almost inevitably tend to, you know, click with those people and get on really well. Yeah, it's, it's like a recognition of like a kindred spirit. Absolutely, I see what you mean. Yeah, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so that's uh, what I suppose that's what I mean by serious magical attitude. I, I often compare that to uh, the same kind of feeling in in the arts field as well. The, you also see the click that it makes when you meet people who are in the same vein. Doesn't, it's not necessarily a question of quality, I think. It's a question of same attitude, as you, as you described it. Uh, and I think there, the arts world and the magical world, uh, and I know them both, I think they have very many things in common somehow. I mean, absolutely. You know, my, my wife is a really talented yeah. artist. You know, she I know, yeah. you know, did her fine art degree in Seville. She's, I love her work. She's a fantastic mm -hmm. artist. And yeah. Yeah, having a partner who's an artist and a magician has a huge number of benefits as well. <laughs> I'm they sure. They do bring an eye, a different eye. I mean, I've learned a lot from her, you know, just her ability to give a different perspective I've, has been yeah. invaluable. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure. When you mentioned uh, earlier your first book, Uh, by those 14 or whatever books it were that you mentioned and you said a few of the titles uh, it hit me that already that sounded very eclectic and also very based in into a direction about the key of solomon you mentioned uh, and and other grimoires and uh, something that must have been something that fascinated you from the beginning, that type of magic and conjuration in particular. And maybe, um, I mean, the audience we have here on this show is, of course, in general, rather well versed in the magical terminology and many of them practice different things. But um, still, I always like from people like you who are deep into a special practice um, to get their explanation of terminology. So could you give a little um, introduction into conjuration, what it is exactly for you, what is its strengths, its weakness, and also its danger, maybe, if you do it wrong? Uh, just give a, a brief five-minute course in conjuration, if you may. <laughs> okay, so, I mean, conjuration... I like the term conjuration because there's so many different terms that I know you, you know, do <laughs> um, uh, can be interpreted or misinterpreted. Um, so basically, it's like um, a di directed interaction with a spiritual creature that whose attention you are seeking to gain to engage in some sort of. Um, activity or relationship with that creature. Um, as a result of that, you may then have a more prolonged relationship with that particular spiritual creature, depending on whether you conjured it for a single purpose or whether it's a spiritual creature that you choose to pact with and have a sort of symbiotic relationship going forward where you do things for each other. Um, it's a process of... Uh, 
purifying and preparing it's a it's not a simple process you know it's doing conjuration is not so you didn't just decide one day oh i'm just going to do a conjuration today <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah 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 the, the conjuration is a major operation um and for which you need a good reason it's not something you do all the time and it's not something you can do too frequently you know i've, talk, I've seen people writing about how doing you know conjurations seven conjurations in a week i'm like how the <laughs> heck do you do that? Because if, if you're doing the conjuration of any major spiritual creature, you've got a seven-day lead-in of, like, your purification Absolutely. and your fasting and all the other your stuff. Choice of, your choice of why you do it and choice of the, the spirit you want to conjure already before that, don't you? Yeah. Yeah, yeah you know, it's like... Yeah. Um, or, like, let's conjure all the goetic demons. Why the hell would you? It's not like they're Pokemon that you collect, you know. Yeah. It's like you, you, call, you call on a spirit because it's got particular qualities that will be beneficial to you that you want it to employ on your behalf and which in exchange you do things for in return. That, mm -hmm. you know, there's a dynamic there. Um, right. So, you know, when people go on about how they've worked with hundreds or dozens and dozens of angels and demons and things, I kind of think, why? Um, to me, conjuration is... It's quite a narrow band thing. You specialize. Um, it's like, you know, I know for example, the Grimoire and Verum has become really popular thanks to Jake Stratton Kent, particularly in yes. recent years. Yeah. Um, and people sometimes say to me, what, you know, what are your experiences? So, well, to be honest, I haven't worked the Verum. I've worked with other Grimoires that have been the ones that called to me. You know, I've worked with Goetia. Um, mm -hmm. I've worked with, um, the Nine Keys. I work with the Olympic Spirits. Uh, I've done a lot of stuff in the Key of Solomon. Um, but there's a whole load of different grimoires. So the moment people start talking about something I haven't done, I just be like, okay, well, I'm going to sit back and listen because I can offer a, this is a subject I can only offer an academic perspective on, not a practical one. Mm -hmm. So this is where. I, I happily sit back and listen to your experiences when you, know, you tell me about what you got from this grimoire and right. the conjurations you did. Um, you know, they're not, as I say, things to collect and just try and do all of. You find the ones that work for you, and I have found the ones that work really well for me. Um, mm -hmm. And and that can be a long process, can't it, to yeah. find that uh, group or that uh, spiritual task that you would like to, to, to conjure. Absolutely. I mean, at the beginning, I worked a lot with, with um, I worked with several of the spirits from the Goetia. Mm -hmm. These days, I don't really work with the Goetia. Right. You know, 30 years ago, yes. Uh, but does it change ago. because you change or does it change because you more and more focus on the, the thing that fits for you? Um, I think both. I have changed and I focus. I mean, I'm not doing conjurations all the time. It's a nice idea, you know, like, but I, I would have to have like a, a reason, you know, um, yeah. it, I'm, I probably would do a conjuration a year, maybe. Yeah. Because there, well, by conjuration, I mean like the big conjuration stuff. Things. There are several spirits that I have pacts with that I don't need to do whole big conjurations to work with because I've got a relationship that I built up over a lot of years. So our, it's, it's a lot easier that relationship that it doesn't require that same level of work. And it's, um, it, 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 it's, it's like a, a kindred spirit, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, compared to a classic conjuration, when you have packed it and you've been working with a spirit for years, it becomes a lot more informal in some respects. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, which makes it a lot easier. 
<laughs> yeah, no, I, I see what you mean. And I think it's important, very important, and I hope people listen carefully to what you say, because um, if somebody like you n does one conjuration a year or needs to do one conjuration a year, um, somebody with the experience that you have, I think we should carefully listen to that because, uh, um, as you say, it's become a kind of sport, right, for some people to... <laughs> How many have you done last week? Right. Yeah. 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 And when you, when you started doing that, I mean, you, it came to you at a very early stage in your, in your personal development in that field, if I understood you well. So was that always part, I mean, other people start with other types of magic, right? Where, where concentration becomes more important maybe later or never becomes that important as it was uh, seems to be in your life because they work in a different way but um can you personally imagine working magic without that type of conjuration and and grimoires and and and, and background um for myself personally i mean i did my first conjuration when i was 16 and i yeah. look back looked back on it afterwards and I, <laughs> you know, it was really like the the innocent fool <laughs> stepping over the ledge. <laughs> you know, I look back and oh my god, I did so many things wrong, but somehow got away with it. Um, <laughs> and then at eighteen, when I learned how you should do it properly, I looked back and thought, "Geez, I don't know how okay. I got away with that, but I did." You but, did, yeah, recently. Um, the it's always been there, but at different levels of intensity. I think for me, mm -hmm. it's like, um, you know, I started studying Kabbalah when I started my practices as well. And that's always been there for me in the background as well. Cause the, I, think right. the, the, I love the beauty. There's a beauty and elegance in Kabbalah. And that really appeals to my sort of more mystical side, if you like. Yeah. Um, and I, no, I, I couldn't really see a non um, spirit engagement um, way forward for, you know, I couldn't imagine that. I mean, things have changed over the years. Um, as I've got older, um, I've got a lot more, uh, I find a lot more relevance, importance for me in engaging with the ancestors and with the dead, which when I was like a young, when I was a teen in my early 20s, there was a whole I think Western mystery tradition vibe of, ooh, the dead. <laughs> they, we stay away right. from the dead. Right, or, right, right, right. Or the, the pagans and the Wiccans like, oh, we'll honor them once a year at Samhain. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, they're always there. And there's a huge amount of power in where you come from, and in both your personal family, in the traditions. You know, so I think... That has become something that's become a lot more important to me as I've got older is, you know, not just living spirits, but the spirits of the dead as well and working with them, mm -hmm. honoring them. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I mean, my practices have changed a lot. In fact, they've probably changed more in the last decade than they have in any of the decades prior to that. Right. Interesting. Enough. And, and do you think that was a, a move that happened because at that age it, it happens? Or do you think that will speed up even more the, the, the older you grow? I think part of it is because um, I got in, involved in um, one of the ATRs. And so that had a big influence on my practice mm -hmm. because, again, the sort of the spirits and the working with the dead that come with that have a big right. influence, which, you know, I was happily discovered, you know, is very compatible with my sort of path, you know, through the grimoires. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But that's right. also another reason why less need for big conjuration because of the spirit relationships that you develop there. Great. Yeah. Let's take our break now, our musical break, as we do in each show. And once again, I want to invite those of you who are musicians to send me their music so that they can be played here in those breaks in the middle of the interview. And um, I will now bring you back that young 
pianist, that pianist Gamaz da, who does, in my opinion, quite extraordinary work. And you're going to hear it now even more so, I think, than in the first piece, which already was quite a treat. You're going to hear two more songs, two more pop songs in that case. Piano covers just piano, just, but it sounds like more than that. Um, so the first will be a very, very famous song. Everybody knows that. Bohemian Rhapsody by Queen and performed by Gamasta on the piano. And after Bohemian Rhapsody, we will return to meet David Rankin again and he will continue to talk about his experiences and then we will move on also more into that grimoire encyclopedia he has recently published. And at the end of the interview, Gamasta comes back and we will hear the sound of silence in that famous new version by Disturbed, but of course the piano cover of that famous new version by Disturbed of the Sound of Silence to round up the musical part of this show. And do not forget that after the third musical piece, I am always coming back and speak to you about next week's show. Right. So let's now hear Bohemian Rhapsody performed by Gamazda on the piano. Then we go back to David Rankin and finally it'll be the sound of silence and then next week's announcement. Enjoy.
of one of your books, um, a definition of magic, which I find quite fascinating and very different from the usual, uh, the usual thing of creating the world by your own will or whatever. It said, I suggest that magic is consciously directed energy flowing towards evolution. Um, you remember that I think it's in in Becoming Magic back then so one of your earlier books yes um, <laughs> are you still with that and if so could you could you expand a little bit on that I find it a fascinating uh, a fascinating definition of magic actually um, I would say yeah I mean I think there's a ma magic as a path and a way of living changes you And that's nothing we talked about, um, you know, what, how you recognize them people. You, the more, yeah. you know, you see someone who's been practicing magic for years and has been seriously practicing, and they will be an ethical person. That is an inevitable consequence of practicing magic seriously. Hopefully, yes. Well, you're right. Seriously, if you do it seriously, I'm absolutely with you. Yes. Mm. Um, and people become more, I think, engaged in wanting the, wanting the world to be a better place. And think like, you know, the idea of people magic, the great work, is the work of making yourself and through yourself, humanity and the world, great. You know, you, and in realizing your own genius, you should be trying to, You know, do everything you can to make the world better around you. So I do right. sort of stand by that definition. You know, it is yeah. like it's a conscious process of personal evolution. And through that personal evolution, you are trying to contribute to the um, evolution of the human spirit. Well, that's what I was going to say. I think it's 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 two different, well, not two different. They are related, of course, but it's evolution with you and then that goes beyond you and goes to the yeah, the human spirit, as you just said. Well, and one wonders uh, if there are enough people working on the evolution of the human spirit, if you look at our world sometimes, but maybe that's just being pessimistic and, and maybe it has always developed in, in some way. Uh, ev evolution always happened. Yeah, I mean, it's the hundred monkeys principle, isn't it? You know, yeah. <laughs> where do we we need to reach that critical mass to make right. that evolutionary leap? And I mean, anyone doing magic seriously hopes that they are spreading enough that other people will yeah. contribute and reach that point because exactly. it's. I don't. I don't see another way forward. Absolutely. Um, At some other place now, I, I don't remember exactly where in your, where in your books it was. Um, it was about you. It was not some text to buy you. It was the kind of short biography that you find in books and so. And it said that you had grown up magically, so to speak, in the late phase of, or in, in that latest magical revival that happened in the 1980s. Do you see the 1980s still? as part of that of that magical revival as it's called i mean it's a historical definition you like it or you don't like it but do you f feel like it that you were active in that time where many many things happened at the same time yeah i mean very much that was where i started meeting other people you know getting involved in more public things and seeing the speed up and the, you know, the change things did from the mid to the late eighties. It was like thing, somebody, if you're in a car, it's like somebody put their foot on the accelerator. Right. Things definitely sped up from there. And mm -hmm. I think they've continued to speed up. Um, I think the late nineties into the early noughties hit a few speed bumps, but I think, Things have, in the last 20 years, again, been speeding up. I mean, that's does give me some hope. Yeah. And that I've seen a lot of positive things. I mean, the 
the Grimoire Renaissance in the last 20 years has been a real revival of the Grimoire stuff. There's a lot more folk magic. There's a lot more engage, you know, people wanting to engage with spirits and mm. with the dead. And I think a lot more people being open to and learning from you know, the ACRs and realizing how much those living traditions actually have to offer and that people can benefit from and the seriousness that is in those things and that when there is community, it's real community. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's not, yeah. you know, it's like just paying lip service or doing it for social hijinks. It's actually that you do look after and care for people. And it also it can also have I don't mean that dramatically, but just in a human way, it, it has some costs sometimes, and you have to invest that. I mean, I don't mean money. I, I, yeah. I, I mean energy. I mean personal engagement, personal cost, right? Yeah. Yeah, I mean that is something <laughs> you're going to see a lot of on the way. I yes. mean, we will we'll go through like our not just the sort of you know, mystical dark nights of the soul, but yeah, big changes do come and hit you sort of over yes. the head at times as you're doing this stuff. It's like an Absolutely. inevitable consequence. And um, yeah, that's where actually having a community or even if it's just a community of peers or friends can really help, you know, Absolutely. keep you leveled and not, so, so that you don't sink. Uh, yeah, that that's where you need. That's the other side of the the social side of of magic. That's where you need the group. That's where you need the egregore. Uh, not so much for also for social support, but also for uh, just for. So well, I, I'm trying. I'm struggling to find the word uh, support uh, just to to be there when you when you're needed as a friend or so. Mm. Yeah. yeah, I mean, that's something else that's changed in the last 30 years. Um, there was this, there was a movement to try and make magic all about psychology. Mm -hmm. And then there was a realization that that wasn't necessary <laughs> and that psychology has its own value and that um, there is nothing wrong with working on yourself as an individual because we all you know, through our lives we'll have experiences that will scar us and leave, you know, the traumas that you may experience and being able to deal with those helps you have that focus and discipline for the magic because it doesn't, you know, you're walking forward head high rather than, you know, with chains holding you back. Right, right. So, Absolutely. Um, you know, I think Israel Regardi was a really good sort of um, promoter of that whole thing of the of value yes. of, um, of therapy without denigrating the magic or trying to say, you know, you know magic and psychology are the same. Yeah, absolutely. And it's also interesting. I mean, I don't know if you heard the the, the episode uh, about three or four weeks ago with that young lady from Sweden who we spoke about Jung and how he was, of course, very much involved in, in, in magic and all that. And at the same time, in his official psychological writings, he rejected magic. But at the same time, he... Uh, probably used it quite a bit so it's interesting also that was purely that phase that you just mentioned where there was that struggle between psychology and and spirituality let's put it that way there's a larger stage actually yeah, yeah i mean i think having a, a sort of panoramic view is like it's important not to reject things based on your prejudices because any prejudice you have is actually a wonderful signpost as <laughs> what you need to be looking at. <laughs> and if you have a prejudice, where does that prejudice come from? Why have I got it? Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. Hopefully you don't have prejudices, but if you do, that certainly tells you that there's things that you need to resolve that will, if you resolve them, will speed up 
Uh, your abs- absolutely. <laughs> That's something I observed when I, for example, I'm, I'm, I'm watching a, a public figure on television and he or she makes me really uneasy and uh, angry because of the behavior or whatever. Then I suddenly ask myself, why? What does that person trigger in me? Uh, oh. And uh, that's an experience I, I personally made because of magical work. I found out that that triggers something in you and why. Yeah. But uh, I think that's what you're talking about, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, what made you a writer? When did you decide now I have to start writing books? Um, I started writing articles back in 86, because I wrote the first article that got published in a magazine. Mm. Um, uh, so, um, then I, when I was in Oxford, I co-edited a magazine there. And then when I was in Cardiff, I did another one through the first half of the 90s. And that I also was running like a correspondence course, a sort of basic magical training. Um, and the material I'd put together for that made me think, I mean, I'd always liked writing, but I hadn't really thought about a book. And my first book was probably one in 97. So I'd been practicing for 18 years when my first book was published. You know. What was your first book? Which, which was the one? Um, Magic Without Peers. Ah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, which was like co-written with my um, you know, first wife. And that was, you know, it was like a practical manual, as it were, of sort of witchy, magic stuff, which did really well at the time. I think it was like, a good time for it. It sold a lot of thousands of copies. People seemed to enjoy it and get a lot from it. Um, mm. That was kind of a reflection of what I was trying to do with the coven that I was running of putting that sort of scope of magical training and practice in there for people. Right. And from there, it just sort of moved on a bit. You know, 2002, I had one done on crystals because I'd always had this – bugbear of people going by crystals being very new age and yes the new age use crystals but you go back to the caves and crystals use you all through the grimoires ancient egypt all these places you've got the use of crystals in magic of course yeah so i did a book on that crystals um healing and folklore and then you know stephen skinner and i met in 2003 and yeah that was one of those clicks that we talk about you know within five minutes of meeting we had decided to that we wanted to write together and that we would um, found Golden Horde. Right. Uh, this is literally the first five minutes. <laughs> we, oh, really? Really? That, that, that fast, really? It was that okay. fast. We, we wow. met, we, we sort of were introduced. He said, oh, I want to show you this manuscript. He showed me it. And he said, oh, I think this needs to be you know, out there. And I said, so do I. He says, I think we should write about it, don't you? And I was like, yeah. Should we make a company? He was like, yeah. <laughs> it's just, that was it. And that was the first one. That was the um, Patrick Angel Magic of John D. Uh, right. Um, uh, that was an important, and stayed an important relationship, right, Stephen Skinner and you, right? Yeah. I mean, that, yeah. from there, um, I was also... You know, I did um, Becoming Magic, which you mentioned earlier. That was a lot of the stuff of my own that I've worked on. Yeah. You know, through the 80s and into the 90s of just playing with ideas and coming up with things because, you know, I'm a great believer in, you know, learn the mechanics of a system so you're fluid in it and then play with it and see what you can do with it and push the boundaries. And Becoming Magic was kind of, you know, some of me doing that. You know, playing right. with ideas and trying to like offer different perspectives on things. Uh, do you like to teach? I have done a lot over the years, but it takes so much time. <laughs> and no, I mean, I, I mean, maybe I, I put the question not uh, not properly. I didn't mean teach in class or teach in sitting a- across with people, but um, teach uh, book book write books that teach. Let's put it that way. I, like I mean, with do, the purpose of teaching, you know, that, yeah. that's what I mean. Mm. Um, I love to make knowledge available. Um, 
And that was the whole point of Golden Horde. We wanted to like make these manuscripts that most people yeah. would not have access to available. Um, mm-hmm. I love to put, put, make fresh material available to people, um, but not just that. I mean, not just the grimoires, also practices and ideas. So from that perspective, yeah, I love to share in the hope that people find value in the stuff that I'm putting out there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, because I mean, uh, I, not, I don't, I don't want to say I confess it. It's, I'm happy to say it. I, I recently taught, um, a group of people here in Vienna. Um, I taught planetary magic and I used your big chapter in the level in ceremonial magic, uh, uh, almanac, um, that I find, uh, your, your chapter in particular fascinating on that subject. It's very, it's very didactic. It's very broad. That's why I used it because it came handy to me to, to bring, to concentrate in the knowledge that I have to, to put it straight and to put it in a way to, to be able to teach it to people. And uh, I find that remarkable in some of your books that that uh, it's a very didactic approach to me but i i was just asking if it was on purpose or if it's just you and then you and you're yeah. the way you are no i um, it's very much i try and write in a way that i hope people are going to find useful whether it be you know information that they didn't have or practices that they find of use for their own um, yeah. Path. Um, you know, I said, I treat my writing as like offerings. You know, people can yeah. choose to accept that offering or not. They, they may find it useful or not. Not everyone will, you know, I'm sure. not that egotistical. I think that everyone's going to look at my stuff and go, Oh my God, you know, these are the best things since sliced bread. <laughs> I'm not, I just a person who has followed my own magical path and, you know, likes to share what I've, you know, found from that path, which, and hope that people find it of value. Right, right, right. right. You know, my life has been dedicated to magic. When, when I got that techniques of high magic at 14, you know, <laughs> I, I did my dedication, like they said, I, you know, I did the, the pentagram ritual and the hexagram ritual and the middle pillar and the ritual of the rose cross and the bornless. And I took the vow and I dedicated my life to magic. Well, I've always that, that's that. good. That, that's good. That, that, that's good. How did the idea, how do you get an idea to write an encyclopedia of grimoires? It's now when you see the result, it's fascinating. And also you think, hmm, did he expect to, to get to 1400 pages when he started or was it just a crazy idea or was it really a plan? I want to do this. How did the plan to that encyclopedia start? Where, where did you get the, the inspiration from? Well, I think it kind of started, I mentioned Mark Mo- Mo- Morgan back in 2010. Right. He asked me, he said, Oh, you're into this grimoire stuff. Um, you know, could you write me like a, like a, something about it, like a pricey about it? So, I wrote it like a paragraph on what's well, each of the 30, what I consider most important grimoires mm-hmm. in this document. And I sent it to him. And so I think that was kind of like the seed. And then as we went in the, the years coming on after 2010 to now, the next 10 years, I saw, saw more and more, you know, really good writers putting more material out there, doing new translations, you know, like academics and practitioners, putting all this material out. And I thought they were getting such a, a glut almost of material. There's so much good grimoire material that for people who don't come in and have the experience in the background, it's like, where do they start? Right. Um, right. You're saying something very important there. It's been a jumelage of academicians, uh, academics and, and uh, practitioners at the same time. And I think that's a very important uh, combination that we only recently in the last 10, 15 years have experienced, right? Yeah. I mean, they've got these people like, you know, Claire Fanger and Richard Kierkefer and Robert Matheson and all yeah. these academics producing really, really good academic material. Serious it's stuff. That, yeah. It's that yeah. dry academia. 
yeah. which practitioners can then take and run with because <laughs> yeah. it's like yeah, it's, yeah, yeah it's exactly <laughs> right this is so but was the idea of the grimoire something that i say okay i'll do that in in my in my living room and maybe someday i'll find somebody to polish it or did you get a kind of um inspiration by Haiti Press to do it or how did that all happen I, I looked at those first I was looking at old documents and I looked at the one that had the 30 paragraphs and I thought there's all this material somebody should write a, a book that gives an overview of all the grimoires to all the so that people coming in can have a, an idea of what there is and I thought well I'm actually quite well placed to do that because, you know, this was what, about five years ago. You know, uh, I've been practicing for, you know, at the time, right close to around 40 years. <laughs> Most of that time I've been involved with grimoires. It, I have the background to actually put this together. Mm -hmm. And there was a Glastonbury Occult Conference and Hayden were there. I, I spoke to us about I said, I've had this idea to do a Grimoire Encyclopedia. Would you be interested? And I explained, like, having the chapters on the different Grimoires and stuff, and she, and Elizabeth was like, that's brilliant. That, you've got to do it. Do it. We'll publish it. <laughs> and she was Great. incredibly enthusiastic and positive, which then I was just like, right, that's what I'm going to do. Um, so I started You need, working, you need but, people like that, right? <laughs> absolutely. I mean, having... You know, somebody who's a publisher who is knowledgeable and enthusiastic and a really good editor uh, and gives you the sort of valuable feedback makes such a difference. So that book would not be as good without, like, the constant to and fro while I was writing it that I had with her. You know, her contribution in helping me be focused and making suggestions made the book a lot better. Um, and, and being focused, uh, I assume, is one of the major challenges with such with such a venture. Because I mean, the material you you can put in there, the material you have put in there already is huge. And I assume that there is three times as much that you could put in there, and you have to make a choice at some point. Yeah, I mean, I I was doing the chapters, and I'd done the first, I think, ten or so. And I realized I needed to do all the appendixes. So I had to go back through. And then, so then I went back through and I started, and I'd have, I don't know, about you know, 10 or 11 spreadsheets open, going through every time I encounter you know, a spirit, that's got to go in. Every time there's a, yeah, yeah. Uh, an incense ingredient, that's got to go in that appendix, the plants, da 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 da, da. And well, I got to about 50 chapters. I was like, How many am I going to do? Okay, I'll do 100. It's a good round number. I've got to have a cutoff point, or this would just go on for the rest of my life and it would never get yeah. <laughs> Exactly. So I, made, I sort of made that decision, got to the 100. Um, you know, and it took me three years of writing every single day, you know, on my nine to five work days, as it were, when I was doing my regular job, I'd do two or three hours. Yeah. Um, on the days I wasn't working, I'd usually do anything from sort of six to 10 hours on it wow. uh, and eventually I made changes, changes along the way to what I thought would go in it and um, some bits got taken out a lot got added in and yeah we ended up with the two volumes you know and yeah next year I'll start on volume three um, <laughs> are you starting volume three I will yeah next year I'm going to work on volume three I have plans for what I want to go in um, there's already about 20 more Grimoire chapters I want to put in, but there's other stuff I want to put to right. Um, right. expand it out. Because I would like to explain, uh, um, the book is in two volumes, the ones that we have for the moment <laughs> is in two volumes, and uh, two bricks, and um, uh, one being the, the Encyclopedia of the Grimoires itself, the 100 chapters that you, that you just mentioned, and the second volume is the appendixes only, um, only, so to speak, 650 pages, I think it is, on appendices. 
and a whole list of, as you just mentioned, for example, um, incense ingredients or a whole list of angels and a whole list of um, herbs and, and and their references, of course, to the grimoires. Uh, it's 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 amazing. I mean, uh, it's 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 just incredible when you go through. Um, it has me. I don't. It's inimaginable how much work you have put in there. How how you did that? But it's it's. How did you? choose those hundred i was very surprised i have to put one question after the other how did you choose the hundred uh, how did you select because that must be hard at some point to say this i take and this i don't yeah i mean i i made a list and the list kept growing as i was going that needs to go in and that needs to go in and i mean i as i was doing the research then you know i actually came across good ones i'd never heard of mm-hmm And I put those in because they were, I thought, that's interesting. <laughs> that's, a, well, that's got some really interesting stuff in. No, uh, that needs to go in. Um, and there was a couple of instances where um, friends contacted me, like um, Steve Savedow, we, you know, we, we're chatting, and he said, oh, I found this really interesting German text that I'm translating. Um, do you want me to send you a copy of my translation? I was like, yeah, that'd be great. So he sent it, and I was like, Steve, I've got to put a chapter on this in. There's some really unique material in here. It's his new book that's just come out, The True and you know, uh-huh. Secret yeah. Mythology. Fantastic yeah. book. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, you know, there's bits in it that you don't see in any other grimoire. So I said, I really would like to put something in Is that okay? And he's like, yeah, please do. So, you know, um, that wasn't on my list because I didn't know it existed. But then he drew it to my attention and it went in. And... So, you know, that happened a couple of times with titles, but uh, mainly it was I was doing things and I was finding them and it's like, oh, yeah, <laughs> I've got to add that. I've got to add that. <laughs> yeah, and you know, about, t- about 10 of the 100 aren't actually grimoires, but they're important texts, like, you know, hmm. things that lead into the grimoires or right, right. are relevant to it. But, um, yeah, they, I could have added more. I will add more in later volumes, but... I had to have my cut-off point. Uh, sure. Yeah, well, as you said, otherwise you will never get published. Um, um, I wanted to ask you uh, about two texts in particular. Um, of course, there is a strong... It goes in, in order, in chrono- chronological order in, in the book. And uh, there's, of course, the 17th century is very much represented, which is which is clear why. Uh, but you have two texts which I w- find interesting. The one is the first and the other is the last. The first is the Bible. So you put the Bible as the first of the grimoires in your book. And can you, can you I mean, you explain it in the book, but can you explain to our listeners Why and and what what made you do that? Yeah, I mean, you know, most of the grimoires are set in a Christian framework. You know, the yeah. the cosmology is Christian, and there's a lot of material from the Bible in the conjurations. There's reference to you know biblical acts and biblical characters. There's quotes from the Psalms used in pentacles, etc., etc., And it seemed to me that the Bible is kind of like the elephant in the room in the grimoire tradition, that it's, there's such a strong influence, but nobody really talks about the Bible. So I thought, you know what? <laughs> I'm putting the Bible in because it's time we acknowledged the importance of the Bible. I mean, you know, the anointing oil in Exodus, for example, is the one, is your standard oil that you use if you don't have a, a specific um, recipe in your grimoire, that's your anointing oil, and it's straight, you're taking it from the Bible. So things like that. I thought it's time that we acknowledged how important the Bible is within the grimoire tradition for all the material that comes from it and setting up the framework. So that is why I put the Bible in there. I, I thought it would maybe give people a bit of a, a wake-up call there because, you know, when I did – During the research, my perspectives changed a lot because it gave me a much more panoramic view of the tradition. So I was seeing things in a bit of a different light, and I thought we really need, you know, to to put the Bible in and acknowledge its influence into the tradition. 
Absolutely. And I mean, uh, I found it fascinating. I was surprised, but I found it very convincing. I also very much liked that brief uh, 30-ish pages, but very complete. And as I said earlier, also their didactic first introduction pages to 30 pages that you start the book with, when you talk about conjuration, the practice of conjuration, and you talk about spirit hierarchies. Uh, I think it's Wow, I mean, it's really it's 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 a, it's a perfect text in itself. Without the other fourteen hundred pages, it is already a great it's already a great stuff. Without complimenting you, but it's true. Well, uh, let's go to the then to the last ones. Um, we can see that the nineteenth century is still rather heavily represented, and then suddenly the twentieth century we only we end up with three texts only one of 1906 one of 1916 one of 1960 and probably when you get closer to your own period the selection becomes more difficult because because uh, maybe that was the reason maybe it's nothing happened in that those years you're going to explain us and then there's suddenly one text from 2021 and and maybe you would like to 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 talk about, well, those last hundred years and especially the 2021 text, why did you choose this one? Um, there's been this tendency in the last particularly 10 years, I'd say, for people to throw the word grimoire around and put it in the titles of books as a marketing ploy. Yeah. To me, grimoires are a particular, there are particular qualities that make a grimoire. Um, and can you name them? Can you can you explain what the grimoire is to you? Um, there are three themes that run parallel in the grimoires uh, in different quantities, depending on the individual grimoires, which are conjuration of spiritual creatures, different forms of divination, and simple charms and spells. And you see them in different quantities through the different grimoires. So you need all of those um, you're generally working with a magic circle and that process of the, the ghost of the conjuration, there's often things about your preparation, the consecrations, the tools, etc. cetera. Um, so to just produce any old book and call it a grimoire of, no. So that doesn't fly for me. Um, the 20th century, I think that it's kind of gone out of fashion as, you know, from... Eliphas Levi onwards, you kind of get this switch over to what becomes seen as the Western mystery tradition. Right. Um, so, and apart from Mathers, you're not seeing that much really happening grimoire wise. I mean, mm. you have um, the Turiel, which is awful. <laughs> podge, podge. <laughs> I won't and explain people palette. how the face I just saw here on the on the little screen but, I have. <laughs> um, but Jake Strand Kent's um, Sworn and Secret Grimoire, which is from 2021. Right, Jake, that's the one that you have in the in the book. Yeah. Yes, the last one, yeah. He followed the pattern of the grimoires. He took something that was a, a, something of a mess, applied the principles of the grimoires and turned it into something into a workable grimoire text. Right. So I put that in. I mean, that was before that text went in, you know, while Jake was still alive. Right. Um, uh, but I'm glad that I put it in as the last text because with all that Jake did and contributed to the grimoire tradition, you know, he's like one of the, the sort of giants that I think it's fitting that that should be the hundredth one. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think it's a great tribute also to, to Jake. And uh, I remember I, I had him on the, on the show here, of course, as well. That was um, just just checking it up. It was in, in 2021. Yeah, that was about when, when that uh, was written in May 2021. He appeared here on the show. And I remember that, that moment very well. Um, so... Usually I ask my guests when we come towards the end of the interview, um, what are their future plans? Now you already somehow this told us a little bit about that by 
talking about volume three and four and five and six of the, <laughs> of the Grim Warriors. Yes, Erzabet, if you're listening, don't get shocked <laughs> if I say volume six. Um, no, but seriously, um, uh, apart from that, any other plans that you would like to talk about? Um, uh, plans that you do to, about publishing or other plans maybe you would like to talk um, about? I will write other books. I've got a list I've made of books I'd like to write about. Mm -hmm. um, sort of in between that don't take as much time in research and writing as doing a volume of the Grimoire Encyclopedia, but none that I really want to make public It's, yet. Yeah, um, I understand that. Mm -hmm. But I mean, I've got a couple of ideas which I'm excited about for the future um, that have come about as a result of the work I've done on the Grimoire Encyclopedia. It's like, that panoramic view has made me look at aspects of it and think, oh, I think there needs to be something more about this. Right. Yeah, you were reading my mind because I was going to ask you next, um, has the, the work on those many grimoires that you also discovered partly, as you said yourself, has that changed a your creativity? Are you planning to use that, that new knowledge for other stuff or, and has the knowledge of new grimoires also changed your personal approach to your practice? Has that influenced your, your personal practice, the new knowledge that you got there from? Um, experiences I had during writing the Grimoire Encyclopedia have definitely had an influence, yes. Um, I, and the directions that they came from were not the ones I expected. Okay. So that's been interesting. Um, mm -hmm. it's kind of in some respects taken me back to some of my earlier practices that I had not done so much of and it's kind of reminded me of their value and to bring them back more in mm -hmm. um, some of which is like more devotional stuff um, right so yes the I mean it became an, quite an obsessive act you know so i see it as my great work the Google encyclopedia it's ongoing there is going to be a volume three and at some point probably who knows a volume four and stuff in the future i will just carry on writing it for the rest of my life as the tradition grows and hopefully i can you know yeah. chronicle that and continue to make it you know useful contributions that people find valuable i'm sure you will i'm sure you will well david um Thank you for those fascinating 75 minutes in your in your company. It was a really great, great moment. Also, thank you for the deep insight in your personal practice. And uh, I think it was a very, very human and touching uh, moment that we had here. And uh, thanks for the great work you're doing here on this encyclopedia, because uh, I mean, it, as I have said, it, it's, it's quite a task, but it's really worth it. And well, maybe one last question for you. Um, how do you expect or how would you counsel people the use of the encyclopedia? That's not a book that you read. That's not a book that you take and say, okay, I start at page one and go through until I'm at page 1400. Um, How do you use that book? Is it, is it, I mean, it should be more than I want to look up what that, uh, this or that grimoire is about because you want to discover as well. So how would you suggest people should use that? Well, I think if people are drawn to a particular area, then um, A, you can find out if there's a particular spirit, for example, you're drawn to which grimoires it's in and then look those up. But mm. I really did those 100 chapters. I wanted to signpost the work of other people. You know, like every chapter has its wife put the essential right. reading because there's so many good books out there. So it's like if you're interested in this particular grimoire, go away and read this and this to further your understanding and give you insights into what you want to do on the practice. So um, it's really It is there as a resource, but at the same time, um, it is a magical text. So there's nothing wrong with a bit of bibliomancy, for example, and just <laughs> opening it and see where it falls. Exactly. Exactly. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I think you said something crucial here. It's a magical text, and exactly that's how I feel about it. It's, it's not... 
it's it's not uh, uh, just a book that you do, I need to look that up. What is it? But it's discovery by yourself. It's it's more than that. Uh, take it as you said. Open the book and see where it opens and and read and carry on. Yeah. Would you Would you agree on that? Yeah, absolutely. Particularly, well, volume one. <laughs> yeah, of course, of course, volume one, and then volume two is is another matter. True. <laughs> Thank you, David. Thank you for your time. Thank you for being with us here today. And well, good luck in all your ventures and keep enjoying us. Thank you very much. It's been a great pleasure. Sound of Silence, famous song initially by Simon and Garfunkel, then re-brought on the surface lately by Disturbed. And this was this wonderful piano cover version by that young pianist Gamasta. Find out more about her on her YouTube channel, which of course is linked in the show notes. Thank you. Thank you so much, David Rankin, for this enormous task that you undertook with the Grimoire Encyclopedia. Thank you for having been with us in my company here today on this show. It was lovely to talk to you. And thanks to everyone who listened to this show. 
to this show who I really like producing both every time and also today. I learn so much, uh, learn so many new things. It's wonderful every time. Um, great to be around all of you and around all those great people who um, I really like interviewing. It's great to do a podcast, I must say. Lovely. So, what is going to happen next week? Well, next week I will have Robert Gordon back on the show. You remember, Robert, we talked uh, before the break, so it's about almost a year and a half ago, on his book on 21st century Rosicrucianism. But what became already clear back then is that Robert, he is deeply involved in the Western tradition, and he is very knowledgeable and a practitioner about it, but he is also a researcher in future technologies, in the future in the development, and he marries those two things in a very, very particular way. So we are going to talk about AI, so artificial intelligence, yes, here on the podcast, but artificial intelligence and technology of the imagination so we can we will cover different things relevant to that from occultism and magic to alchemy hermetism as memoria neuroscience you will really like to talk right so this is it for today i hope you will have a good week and i'm very much looking forward to meet you again next sunday with robert gordon and now, take care, stay tuned, hear you soon.